Some time ago, I started a recording in the Gospel of John. Often I do Greek and Hebrew recordings, looking at the grammar. But in this recording, I am just looking at the flow of thought from the, Eng from, from the text. That's it, without a lot of detailed grammar. The book of John is a wonderful book. It begins with a prologue. We talked about how what a beautiful prologue from John 1, 1 to verse 18, showing Christ as the eternal word, as the agent of creation, as the one who basically became man and pitched his tent among us, and we gazed upon his glory, John says, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We then move from there to show that from that point on, Jesus begins to collect disciples that he calls to follow him. And then as we move into chapter two, we, have, we, we start finding the miracles in the discourses. We have the great miracle of changing water to wine. This is followed, remember, by the discourse showing his creatorship in chapter 3 to Nicodemus, that he can give new birth to one like Nicodemus who's willing to believe. It is birth from above. We also see it in the discourse with the woman at the well, that he can create living water whereby she'll never thirst again. And so Moving from that discourse then into chapter five, uh, really we could say in, at the end of chapter four, Jesus heals a nobleman's son at a distance, showing again the great miracle of his divine authority. He heals a paralytic at the pool, uh, remember uh, at the sheep gate, this is followed then by Jesus talking about who he is. There was a debate that he had done it on the Sabbath. And so there was a debate of, among some of the Jewish leaders at that time critiquing him for breaking the Sabbath. And remember, he established his authority, authority that's equal with God, authority that is witnessed by John the Baptist, authority that is also witnessed by his works, and then again by the Father, and finally by the scriptures. Moses spoke about me. And so all the way through, having done that, we then move into chapter 6, where we saw Jesus feeding the 5,000 and walking on the water. We see again his miraculous work as the God-man, feeding 5,000 and walking on water. At that point, then, we have the discourse on the manna come down from heaven. The rabbi said, when Messiah comes, he will bring the manna back. And so Christ, all the way through chapter 6, is claiming to be that manna that has come down from heaven. And that if one is willing to believe, then one can experience that eternal manna. At the end of chapter six, there is a beautiful confession by Peter. Notice when Simon Peter, uh, Jesus said, will you all go away as well? Others had left him. And notice Peter's confession, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And I think that that is so true even today. To whom shall we go? And we must believe, according to John, that Jesus is the true life. And where else can we go? He has the words of eternal life. 
Following this, in chapter 7, and this is where we stopped last time, we begin to see Jesus' brothers who do not believe. And I'm going to read and make comments like I've been doing. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews had sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacle was at hand. His brothers, therefore, said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples may also see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, then show yourself to the world. We're told that the brothers were not really believing. We're told even his brothers did not believe in him. So Jesus did not have his own family believing in him. Then Jesus said to them, my time, <coughs> my ideal time for this, my kairos, the time that is appointed has not come, but your time is already ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. In other words, Jesus said, that's why the world hates me. It doesn't hate you, he's saying to his brethren, but this is what I testify. You go up to the feast. I am not yet going up to this feast for my time has not yet come. And when he said, I am not yet going up, I think he had planned to go up, but not at the time that his brethren were saying. Uh, they were simply uh, trying to get him to go at the wrong time. He's waiting until the father's time to go up. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But then he does go up. He goes up secretly to the feast. But when his brothers had gone up, then he went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. Some said he is good. Others said no. On the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Notice there is a debate going on. And by the way, that debate still rages today. Some believe in Jesus, others do not. And there's always that divide. And so we go on. Jesus begins to talk about his authority and where it comes from. And John is driving this home, that his authority comes from the Father. Now, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters, having never studied, having never studied under a rabbi? How does he know letters? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but the one who sent me. Uh, but it belongs to him, speaking of his father. If anyone wants to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who speaks the glory of the one who sent him is true <clears throat> and no unrighteousness is in him. Notice Jesus is claiming <clears throat> what I'm speaking is coming directly from the Father. Did not Moses give you the law and yet none of you keep the law uh, because why do you seek to kill me? By the way, <clears throat> I think they kept the law religiously, 
but they didn't keep the spirit of the law. You shall not kill. And Jesus is saying, but really in your hearts, that's what you want to do. The people answered and said, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work and you all marvel. In other words, going back to the healing that he brought uh, early on in the Gospel of John. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcised a man on the Sabbath. In other words, you break the Sabbath as well by circumcising. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you then angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? This goes back to that debate that we saw following the miracle of Jesus healing of the man on the Sabbath that had broken out. And so do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So really, you are judging me unrighteously. And what I've done, I've done in agreement with the Father. Then he goes on to talk about how his origin comes from the Father. And some of them from Jerusalem said, is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from. But when Christ comes, the Messiah, no one knows where he is from. Notice again, we know he's from Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple saying, you both know me and you know where I am from. And I have come not of myself, but he who sent me is true whom you do not know. Again, he continues to drive home the fact that he's coming from the Father. But I know him, and I am from him, and he sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Notice the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of both the Father and the Son. They could not take him until his hour had arrived. And many of the people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? In other words, is he going to be able to do more and do more signs? So some were believing. Jesus goes on now to talk about how he's going to go back to the Father. The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. And Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. I'm going back to the Father. You will see me and not find me, and where I am you cannot go. The Jews said among themselves, where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? That is, is he going to go where some of the Jewish people have been dispersed among the Greeks and teach them? What is this thing that he said, you will seek me? and not find me, and where I go, you cannot come. Notice again, uh, he's driving home who he is and how he's come from the Father. He's going to go back to the Father. He knows all of this, which shows in John's writing here that he is truly God 
and he is truly man. He is truly the perfect God-man. And then Christ makes an amazing statement. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spake concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would later receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. By the way, at the Feast of Tabernacles, which was the celebration of the fall festival, when they would live in temporary dwellings for a while, seven days, looking at the temporary dwellings they had in the desert, anticipating the permanent dwelling in the land, uh, on the seventh day, water would be poured out from the pool of Siloam, uh, saying that God will provide our thirst and take care of us. Jesus then makes that claim. If you really want spiritual water, I'm the one that's going to give it if you believe in me. The same theme we saw with the Samaritan woman. And what he's speaking of is the Holy Spirit who would come out of one's heart and out of one's belly and heart will flow rivers of living water. And how true that is when one accepts Christ as Lord and Savior. There is that spiritual water that Jesus provides, and that's the Holy Spirit which Jesus poured out at Pentecost. Then following these words, there is a division over him. Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, truly, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. In other words, they were saying, this is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18 that was to come. And this that must truly be the Christ. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? We've already heard that. Can any good thing come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? Now, it is true. <laughs> They're thinking of Micah 5.2, uh, where the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. Uh, they probably, well, they weren't familiar with Matthew, where the birth of Jesus was in Bethlehem. And so it's sort of ironic, because John would have been written after Matthew. And I think what he's showing here is, because of their unbelief, they missed the point of Jesus. So there was a division among the people because of him. Now, some of them wanted to take him but no one laid hands on him because, again, his hour had not yet come. And by the way, there's always a division around Jesus Christ. It's no different today than then. <clears throat> those, there are those that believe and love him and want to serve him, and there are those that they take, they're, they're totally the opposite. And so this is something that John's telling us happened at this point and later on, we'll go on. The world will hate you because it hated me, Jesus will say. The Sanhedrin then is really in confusion. The officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees and said to them, why have not you brought him? The officers answered, no one ever spake like this man. Then the Pharisees answered and said, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. In other words, there were those in among the Sanhedrin who were confused. And uh, others were saying, you haven't believed in him, have you? And at this point, uh, Nicodemus speaks up. He who came to Jesus by night 
being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? Do we judge a man before we really know the full truth? And Nicodemus must have had a conversion experience, many believe, in John 3. And he's speaking up at this point. They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. In other words, they continue to say, he can't fit what a prophet should do and, uh, and be. He can't be the Messiah because he's not coming out of Galilee. Uh, excuse me, he's not coming out of Bethlehem. And everyone then went to his own house. So this chapter is an amazing chapter. And I think it, it shows us that Christ, his authority comes from the Father. And his own family did not believe his authority. And his not only origin comes from the Father, and he comes to do the Father's will, but he's going back to the Father. And that does happen at the after the resurrection. He ascends back to the Father. And he, John tells us, is the real source of living water. If you want living water, if you want life, and water is what sustains life. And he's talking about eternal life. If you want that, then believe in me, Jesus says, and the Holy Spirit will make that happen because he'll come into you and be that source of living water. And then the chapter then concludes with the division over Christ, a division that continues, as we have said, even to this very day. May we be like Peter and say, Lord, to whom shall we go? There's no one else. You have the words of eternal life.